Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, your 2019 Information Management Resolution. I am Teresa Resick and I'm the Director of Online Events here at AIM and AIM is your host and producer of things. Uh, with me today are AIM's Chair of the Board, Mark Patrick, and then we also have David Janess from IBM. And IBM is the underwriter of today's webinar and we thank them for their support. And thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. And as we get started, I just want to offer a few logistics uh, uh, to make things easier for you for viewing our event. Um, by joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience, so feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows that are on your screen. And across the bottom is a list of all of the widgets that we have available to you. And group chat is one of those available, but it does not default open on your desktop. So you would just click on that uh, group chat icon and it will open and you'll be able to text chat with each other and also with a few of us here at AIM. Do ask questions of the speakers throughout our time today using the Q&A feature and we'll hold them until the end where we should have about five or 10 minutes to answer them. You can also use this feature to ask for technical assistance. You can also download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list. And there's also a few other uh, links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. So just click in there at any time and that resource will open in a new browser tab and you can save and read it after the webinar. And at the end of the webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser and it is also in the widgets uh, below the slide area and I would greatly appreciate it if you would take a few moments to offer your feedback. And this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to AIM.org's resources webinars page in just a few days. And as you may be aware, I just wanted to let you know that um, AIM has, uh, we did uh, have a drawing set up uh, and that uh, drawing is a free giveaway for the, one of our BPM specialist online courses. And by attending today, you are eligible for this, uh, for your name to be drawn for this. And uh, we're going to be drawing that at the end of the webcast and announcing who our winner is. So stay tuned to see if you are the winner of our um, BPM Specialist Online course. And so right now I do want to introduce the speakers that we have with us today. And Mark Patrick is the 2018 Chair of AIMS Board of Directors. And he's wrapping up his fifth year on the board with one more to go as our former chair. Uh, he is a retired Navy helicopter pilot, but for the past 11 years has had an information management leadership position in a U.S. federal agency. He discovered AIM through uh, AIM's local National Capital Chapter some years ago. And Mark is a certified information professional, and he thinks you should be too. And Mark is a frequent speaker and panelist on information management issues, which has you know, failed to impress his wife and family. Um, he does live and work in Northern Virginia, um, but prefers Central Virginia as his getaway. And his spouse is also a federal manager for a different agency, and they have three grown children who are out of the nest and almost completely off the payroll. Then we also have with us David Janess, and David is a writer and public speaker who specializes in communicating the benefits of new technologies to business decision makers. At IBM, he develops the messaging strategy, uh, writes executive speeches and videos, and produces IBM Live events. And prior to 2010, Mr. Janess performed a similar role with Capture Pioneer DataCap for 12 years there. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to Mark Patrick to begin our discussion today. Um, Mark, please go ahead. All right. Thank you, Teresa. Very glad to be with everyone today. Thanks for tuning in. I thought I would open up with um, sort of a fairly new presentation of AIM's new branding graphic on intelligent information management. Actually, uh, the board of directors meeting that occurred yesterday, there was some fairly uh, good discussion on the various pieces of this. But um, this is, uh, you'll see this probably a lot more on AIM products going into the new year. So I thought that I would just take the beginning part of this time to just talk about that really quickly. IIM is a practice that integrates process information and technology to achieve a new digital state. And each one of the puzzle pieces here, starting with content services, which is you know, one of the more familiar um, 
areas for AIM, but I wanted to point out that the, the choice of the word services and all the, the pieces there are, is intentional because the way modern enterprises need to be able to link these capabilities together on the fly to respond to continually changing business environment. So uh, at the initial pass, uh, the, the marketing team and board of directors has been thinking that this uh, section includes things like business content, um, collaboration, transactional content, et cetera, and that the uh, process services piece is where things like business process automation, robotic process automation, low code and blockchain may come in, although there was some discussion about that at the board yesterday. Um, and so the, these things may change. And the same thing for multi-channel intelligent capture, quite a bit of discussion on whether that belonged there or back in content services. But these other type things having to do with analytics and data uh, protection, et cetera. So um, that sort of wraps up, uh, you know, a quick overview of the graphic, but, uh, you know, I find it to be a very good conversation starter graphic, depending on, uh, you know, matter who you are, whether you're a vendor, an integrator, consultant, uh, an end user, but the, the main thing is, is that really it's all about the business, transforming the business, it's never really been about technology, and it's all about business improvements, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So, um, let me just finish my introductory remarks here with this concept of the fact that uh, intelligent information management is a journey. Uh, so it, it sort of starts out with simple digitization, going paperless and things like that. Um, and then you go on to optimize those with things like um, RPA, collaboration, some various more complicated uh, ways of doing things. But we're ultimately moving towards uh, fully di digitally transforming where we're going after improving customer experience, operational efficiency, automated compliance, or in the public sector like I am in, you know, really optimizing mission performance, decision support, and things like that. And we start to get into some of these other things. So uh, an introduction to kind of a a journey approach um, to get to what that graphic depicts. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to David to take it a little bit further. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, when Mark and I started talking about how this story would flow today and we looked at the, these phases, I said, hey, I've got some great examples from uh, our customer base that uh, show uh, the stages and show uh, the benefits of going through these stages. And so that's what I want to do today is tell you a couple of stories that I happen to know the inside uh, scoop on and, uh, and, and really bring it to life, what, what this all means. And I want to start with a story that came out in the New York Times in early November. And it was about uh, times going digital. It's a perfect example of digitization. And if you think about uh, the New York Times, they started using photographs in 1896. So that's more than 120 years of visual history that they have. And uh, they say they've got about 6 million photographs in their collection. And their collection is housed uh, three floors down in the basement, down where they keep the records, of course. Records managers will understand that. And... Uh, they call it the morgue. Now, that's a little dark there, I think, but uh, it's a huge room filled with steel filing cabinets. Now, I have a friend, actually, who's a photo editor at the Times, and if she needed a photo for a story on, you know, some history, say uh, Times Square during World War II, for example, she'd go down to the basement, fill out some cards, and a, a, a person there would... Uh, scurry off and come back maybe a couple hours later with a stack of photos. If some of them had already been pulled out, they wouldn't be available to my friend, and uh, she'd never be able to get that. So uh, I think many of you will recognize this old-fashioned manual form of, uh, of archiving. And uh, you might wonder, geez, uh, with the digitization around for about 25 years, what took so long for the New York Times? But nonetheless, they have started a scanning project, thanks to people like my friend who uh, were pushing for computer-based solutions. So right now, about six people are scanning about 1,500 images a day, providing the metadata, right, so they can be searchable. And this helps the photo editors now work at the speed of news. But check this out. What's interesting and what came out of this story is that the Times 
has started a series called Past Tense. And here's where they're publishing tabloids, say 48-page sections on different historical topics. And they'll have a dozen or so uh, photos from their collection. In it. So it's, it's led to a new product. But even further, they have a partnership with Google now, which is helping them monetize their content. And that uh, brings them a new revenue stream and indeed a great reason uh, to, and, and a way to pay back their digitization project. So to me, that seems like if you're wondering what digitization is, and don't ask me to say it again, uh, there it is right there, a great example. I'm going to segue to another example uh, of digitization. I got through that this time. And uh, it's uh, an important cancer research center that uh, clearly needed to get into intelligent information management to improve patient care. Now, here's the problem. Cancer diagnoses and treatments involve multiple specialists, Often a patient has been to, you know, many different types of doctors. They have complex symptoms, and it's very common for a patient in this research center to have a stack of medical records about as tall as they are when they stand up. And, of course, uh, analysis in that situation is impossible. If a document has been requested and not available when a, a patient uh, care provider needs it. That is kind of catastrophic. Uh, so the manual process is not really the right way to go for good health care. So they began a digitization process. Now, once I get going, I can really do it here. Um, and that's just about as robust as the New York Times was. I think they had uh, almost a dozen people just scanning like crazy, getting these uh, medical records and medical documentation digitized, and now clinical researchers can access the same information concurrently, right? So if uh, more than one person needs it, they can pull up the entire records. And they're exploring now using Watson Health and other analytics types tools, which they could never do when they were in the paper world. Now let's go to digital optimization. And I picked out a, a company in the energy field, but also one that is fairly small, not a Fortune 500 company. In fact, they have an IT department of two. And that just demonstrates, I think, uh, how, how these technologies can be applied at, at any level. So uh, this is a company that supplies power to uh, Alabama and parts of the Florida panhandle. And uh, they, uh, a few years ago, began this digitization process. They had documents, uh, HR, accounts payable, a lot of back office type documents, and legal documents, all in paper form. And this is important because if you think about uh, what a power company does, a lot of what it does is maintain its infrastructure. And that means uh, linemen are out uh, working on these lines which cross people's property. Now, they have secured the right of way legally, but when a property owner confronts a lineman and says, hey, get off my land, they, they have to be able to quickly access the property document that says, no, we have the right of way here, and we're, we're not doing anything <laughs> illegal. It actually is quite, a, quite an issue for them. They, it used to take weeks. Sometimes they'd have to go to a courthouse and start searching for documents, and now they can call it up in seconds. So imagine... Uh, waiting weeks to complete a maintenance project because you can't find the document. So here you have uh, a case management uh, solution set up. So for every project, you have all the content needed within the case. You can call it up, and you can continue to add to it as you uh, do your work. And, uh, and so the knowledge uh, grows uh, within the organization. So here's a great example of digital optimization. Once you get things up and running, Here's another example, and this is the insurance industry, Western and Southern Life Insurance. Uh, they, they started their journey with us in uh, 2013. They're a life insurance company. They've got health, annuities, mutual funds, investment brokerage. So full service. And so they began by digitization, and they did a, quite a, a good job of, of measuring. So they were scanning about 450 unique document types, and they reported uh, just a couple years later at one of our conferences 
Uh, they reduce head count by about 40 percent, right, because manual document processes were eliminated and we didn't need as many people lugging paper around. Errors were reduced. Uh, when you're indexing manually, you can put in the wrong metadata and then you'll never find the document. So errors reduced by about 40 percent, they say. Training time reduced for new hires because they simplify processes. And then when the volume of work went up because the company's growing, they actually didn't need to add staff. So the point here, the takeaway is that digitization pays for itself. And that's a, a, a rule there that you should keep in mind. Well, then they started connecting people and processes. And they are preparing a presentation for our February technology event called Think, where they will detail their success in automating some business processes. Uh, annuity new business, for example, streamlining the onboarding process with workflow. Uh, creating a, a modern, intuitive user interface that helps people and technology work together. I mean, this is really where, where you really start to see the value where, uh, where machines and people uh, can do a heck of a lot more together when uh, everything is, uh, is aligned well. And this is a company that does very good metrics, so I'm looking forward to seeing what, uh, of, uh, what Western and Southern has uh, to say about these, these processes. But uh, they, they've been on this journey, and uh, they're headed towards that last one, that digital transformation, which is really the ability to connect to the customer in a way that you never could before because you've got uh, all of your content is digitized, all of your processes are working to well together, they're connected together. And, uh, and so here's a great example of this U.S. state they don't want to be named because in state government, everything is political. Hey, who knew? Uh, so, you know, keep your head down. But the story is absolutely inspirational. So let's begin with just the numbers. They've been through the digitization stage. They're continuing to add about 1.6 million pages a day, about 100 million a quarter. But they've also converted 90% of their vendor-facing applications to electronic, so they're not getting paper. They're not scanning so much. Their, their documents are coming in electronically, uh, which certainly is a, a better problem. Uh, so once they got through this digitization, then they actually have become the poster child for digital optimization as well. They've built more than 80 applications, workflow, case management type projects that streamline and accelerate departments. And one, one super example is the Office of Children and Family Services where a family, let's say, wants to adopt or become a foster family. Now, as you might imagine, there's a vetting process that kicks off, and there are background checks. And it used to take about three months to get through this process and become an approved uh, parent or, or, or foster family. And imagine if you're a child who's uh, met the, the family they want to join, and they have to wait three months. It just seems... Uh, it seems extreme. So uh, they put together a case management solution uh, and, and automating a lot of these processes and, and this information gathering, which has to happen. And they got the whole process down to two days. And so in, in terms of measuring success, that one is a pretty good example of, of how, how you can uh, deliver something, a, a better experience, certainly to citizens. Uh, using these tools. And so that really leads to uh, the third phase, this digital transformation phase, is the ability to connect to customers, in this case, citizens. They have 100,000 users in all state agencies and counties. They're connecting people and processes in you know, DMV, taxation, healthcare, human services, Department of Transportation, the state park system. It's a true digital transformation success story and, uh, and one that I think we can all be inspired by. So here we have the three phases in action uh, with, with real uh, documentation. Uh, these folks have, have come and presented, and uh, I've gotten to meet them. It's, it's pretty interesting to, to see this stuff in action. And so with that, let's go back to Mark. Thanks, David. So, um, being an end user myself, uh, I've sort of, I really, those are great use cases. Uh, I just wanted to share a little bit of my personal experience without getting into specifics about my organization. But uh, to start that, 
uh, I want to go back and just, this is sort of a way that AIM has looked at this journey uh, in recent years, talking about going from the digitization phase, wherein we're creating systems of record, and then digital optimization, where we're creating systems of engagement, and digital transformation, where we're moving into systems of insight. The thing I really focus on a lot with this journey is the who. So the, the who of this is it's changing, but it's, it's also, it's not uh, going from one group to the next. It's actually expanding this group of folks. So in digitization, you're talking about records and document and process specialists. And then as you move into engagement, you start talking about knowledge workers and lines of business and kind of into the decision-making support area. And then as you get into insight, you start to really get into uh, the data people and uh, the C-suite or the executive leadership of your organization if you're you know, a public sector leader. And that um, is really something that I sort of have experienced firsthand and want to uh, you know, talk to folks who are new at this journey or um, you know, just try to figure out why they're having a tough time to think about this, um, this change as we go through this. Now, when I first threw this graphic up, David said, why do you want to make people afraid? And I, I thought about that and I said, well, it really has a lot to do with my personal background because I, as I it was told in the uh, introduction, I'm a, a helicopter pilot. And uh, helicopter pilots can be kind of pessimistic. And to illustrate that, there's a famous uh, quote at least among helicopter pilots, it's famous from Harry Reasoner back in 1971, and he said this about helicopter pilots. The thing is, helicopters are different from planes. An airplane, by its nature, wants to fly, and if not interfered with too strongly by unusual events or by a deliberately incompetent pilot, it'll fly. A helicopter does not want to fly. It is maintained in the air by a variety of forces and controls working in opposition to each other, and if there is any disturbance in this delicate balance, the helicopter stops flying immediately and disastrously disastrously. There is no such thing as a gliding helicopter. Not quite true, but that's okay, Harry. This is why being a helicopter pilot is so different from being an airplane, air, airline pilot, uh, and why in gener generality, airline pilots or airplane pilots are open, clear-eyed, buoyant extroverts, and helicopter pilots are brooding, introspective anticipators of trouble. They know if something bad has not happened, it is about to. And I hope at least for David, that explains why I tend to start with, hey, it's going to be hard, it's going to involve more people, and it's probably going to take longer than you think. It is, after all, an endless journey. But really, um, the thing that uh, – this is, this is a positive thing for folks like me because we know that folks who are information professionals that really have their hands around this transformation process, plenty of job security there. But three ideas I really wanted to uh, pull from my personal experience over the past 11 years – are these, uh, that IIM is not only about technology, it is holistic, and that the journey is continuous. So first off, the not only about technology piece. You know, uh, there was some discussion that uh, David said about the process in uh, the, the um, use cases that he went over. And I found that to be very important. If you're an information governance person, uh, records person, if you don't have a strong background in process management, um, it's important to grow in that area, to, to um, meet the folks who do it in your organization if they're there. I mean, you don't have to be uh, you know, a, a Lean Six Sigma black belt or you know, have incredible experience with continuous process improvement, but all of your information is either being consumed or being uh, produced produced by your business processes. So if you're not familiar with those processes and the people who are focused on that, then you're going to um, not be able to get to this holistic approach. So it's an, it's an area that I learned that if you have a technology that has a poor process built into it or that the folks aren't trained well in the process, you're going to have problems. The second thing that I wanted to say um, about this is not just about technology. So um, I, I took this little bit from a Microsoft T-shirt that I got in the gift shop out in Redmond, but they really took it from the 1986 song. Uh, you know, some of you may recognize Word Up by Cameo. But the, the thing is, is the vocabulary that as this expanding group of stakeholders uh, grows, moving from digitization towards transformation, you have these cultural cultures 
that come together in the building that you work in to try that must work together and understand one another. And I've observed them talking past one another using different words for the same thing. Somebody from IT uh, doesn't understand what a record is. Somebody if that's from a records background um, is not comfortable with using terms associated with data. You start talking about structured and unstructured data, and you can really have a challenge. So one of the things that, that I have learned is that you have to be sort of a, a cross-cultural communicator in the space if you're going to make these uh, projects that have to be integrated and span large parts of your organization work. So you have to be able to translate. You have to be able to you know, eliminate acronyms and things like that so that folks can come together and uh, successfully get something done. So definitely more about people and process there than technology. But critical. So um, when you come to the concept of holistic, so long before I was exposed to that AIM graphic, I came to believe um, that all organizations, whether public sector or private sector, essentially do these five basic things or some variation of them. Now, when you look up holistic and look for an image, I found a lot of images with stacked rocks and some you know, serene background. I'm not really sure what that's about. I'm sure that somebody out there knows what that means, but I'm like, okay, I'm going with this as a holistic graphic. So you have um, task management or some sort of business process management workflow, something in that cluster, uh, collaboration, search, data management, whether it's structured, unstructured, you call it records, stuff, whatever you call it, and then some sort of business intelligence or reporting on your processes that you have plugged into this holistic set of stuff. And then as, you, as time has gone on, we've gotten into much more complex analytics over the data that we have. So you're doing all of these things, and you're doing them in an integrated way. And what I suggest is that it, you know, there are sort of two strategic imperatives. One is that all your information needs to be discoverable and that it all needs to be life cycle managed. So you can't really approach any one of these sort of subsets in a silo and, and do it, you know, on its own. So that's, that's what I mean when I say holistic. So when you're looking at your organization, you're trying to connect the dots and the folks associated with these dots and the processes and the technologies all together in one beautiful, you know, thing. So because it's complicated, because you have all those stakeholders, you're, ne you're not going to get it right on the first pass. You're going to iterate. You're going to pilot. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn. You know, you're going to identify gaps, and you're constantly going through this process uh, of, of growing towards a more digitally transformed organization. So I say enjoy the journey. Don't be fearful, you know, unless it motivates you like it motivates me, and, and uh, just um, – move along and um, work your way steadily and surely in an incremental way towards intelligent information management. Uh, so those are some uh, personal thoughts, and uh, happy to answer more questions during the Q&A. Back over to you, David. Well, thank you. And uh, now I will add riding in a helicopter to the list of things I will never do. But, uh, <laughs> Riding is not so bad. Jumping out, you know, gliding. <laughs> so. Gliding. <laughs> uh, we call it auto rotation, but anyway. It is. I am. I am deeply impressed, and uh, and and certainly you are a hero. So happy to be uh, on board here with you. And I I uh, want to just do a little bit of uh, of uh, you know business here uh, and, and explain to you what you've just been hearing involves and, and, and with the stack rocks, you know, you, you've got the sense that there are many different technologies and, and Mark talked about, you know, the content and capture pieces. He talked about the process pieces. He mentioned uh, robotic process automation and analytics and, and what uh, we at IBM have recognized is that this journey requires multiple capabilities. And you'll see in blue here sort of the, the core key ones that, uh, that AIM often uh, serves and, and does their webcast on and their, and their industry watches on, you know, capture for sure, and that's across the top because it connects to uh, so many different uh, pieces of these solutions. Tasks is how we describe robotic process automation. It's just getting something done. It could be opening something, closing something, copying and pasting. Content, of course, is that whole, what we used to call ECM piece here, 
the repository, the services, the governance, all of the, the, the ways that we protect content. Workflow is everything from straight through processing to, uh, to BPM type workflows to uh, adaptive case management uh, and dynamic case management where knowledge workers uh, interact. And we heard a couple of examples uh, uh, in, in my stories. And then decisions is business rules and how there's ways to automate uh, policies and, and governance uh, with, with, with business rules. And so many of these solutions and, and some of the ones I, I talked about are using these together and they're, uh, they're connected. And there's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And so we recognize that the, that the users across all of the industries we serve would uh, find great value in a connected platform. And we call it the IBM Automation Platform for Digital Business. In fact, you can buy it as a uh, platform buy and then use whatever it is you need to use in your application. And, and customers really like that flexibility. And as you see, it sits on a, a foundation of, of governance, uh, of records retention, document retention that has to be done across and, and, and process governance. And then increasingly we're seeing analytics and intelligence and machine learning impacting these. And, uh, and then, of course, deploy them on cloud in a hybrid or multi-cloud environment uh, or on-prem. So the idea is to be able to provide uh, our, our and users with uh, all of this, the, the capabilities that they need to, to go in any direction. But then, okay, just because you have everything doesn't mean, and this is where we get, I think, into the resolution theme here, doesn't mean that you're guaranteed success. There is actually uh, some methodologies here that can help. And you'll hear just as many uh, failed projects as successful ones uh, in this world the longer you stay in it. And, uh, what I did was ask a lot of uh, our customers who have successful uh, deployments, so how did you succeed? How did this work? And I began to see some familiar patterns, and you'll also find that Forrester and Gartner and, and IDC and others who are in the business of advising customers will have a similar type of approach, but at a very high level, you need to build a business case. It starts with a business case. And often you're going into brand new territory. So you don't have your own numbers. You don't have your own economic uh, impact analysis. You have to take case studies from the outside world. You have to listen to analysts. You have to read. You have to kind of put down some guesses and build that first initial business case. And then you take it to the stakeholders, the business leaders, the line of business, the governance, the uh, IT uh, security, all of the folks that weigh in on this, and in fact, probably even the, the financial people who want to pay for it. And you say, so what's the goal here? What, what are we trying to do with this particular application? And, and get everybody's buy-in. This is very important part of the process. So that leads you building the vision. So you built the vision, and it's time now to uh, put a pilot program together or a proof of concept or some kind of test some little thing you can put up in the cloud and run it. And, you know, a limited but measurable approach. And then collect the data on that. And you can collect the data from customers, right, through surveys and the NPS and however else you measure customer sentiment. You can collect your operational data. How much more uh, are we doing, you know, productivity-wise? How is the quality? You know, are we reducing errors, as we've seen in a lot of these stories, it reduces errors. And then what are our cost savings, uh, headcount reduction or uh, operational efficiencies that lead to uh, cost savings or uh, soft benefits uh, or increased revenue? Uh, and then now you're ready to actually build your bigger, more accurate business case, business case 2.0, and roll out something larger. So the idea of sort of walking before you run, following this sort of simple step here, I think it's something uh, very important to, uh, uh, to keep in mind as you approach 2019. And so lastly, I want to say that in February of 2019, many of the stories that I told uh, were customers who came to our annual event called Think, 
this year, Think 2019. It's in San Francisco, February 12th to the 15th. Uh, and they, uh, and I help uh, with their presentations, and I get to know them, and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, Royal Bank of Canada, what they're going to talk about, Trustmark here. MetLife has, has got a great story to tell about their disability claims automation project. And I've also convinced uh, them, I think, to join us at the AIM conference, which you'll hear about in just a minute. So, uh, but look at uh, all of the scope here and, and some good names. Uh, so I, I certainly would encourage you to click on this link here and, and register and, and come and see uh, all of the technology we have, all of the customers we have sharing their story. And uh, we're also going to have a lot of fun in San Francisco. So that's my little, uh, my little piece that I'd, I'd love for you to know about and, and, uh, and with that, I think it's time for some questions, and we can go over to Teresa again. Yes, it is. And, and bef before we start taking your questions, it's one of the things that um, we wanted to ask you. And, and you know, feel free into the Q and A to type in, um, or even in the group chat. Uh, just what are your Intelligent Information Management resolutions for 2019. I know the you know, Mark and David and I were were talking before we went live here, and I know some of the things that um, that there's you know, you know AIM offers a variety of ways to help you do this, and obviously you know we have the training, we have the conference, and I will uh, talk with you a little bit more about that. But just things like uh, the local community. I know that. Um, uh, in reading through Mark's bio, when I introduced him, um, he was talking about he came across AIM because of the local chapter meetings that we have, and just uh, in, in our growing online community, and just wanted to um, invite you to uh, avail yourself to the resources that, that we have, um, and especially like with that online community, it, it is at community.aim.org, and it's a, a whole robust area there uh, for you to um, find other like-minded people to help you as you work through this. So just, uh, uh, you know, welcome for you to type in, you know, what your uh, information management resolutions are. And I do just want to, um, we are going to go to taking questions. And, and one of the questions that have, that has come in here, and I want to go back and, and take a little bit of time with this. And, and Mark asking you to put on your, you know, chair of the board hat again here. And, and the person is asking, um, you know, back in with this uh, new graphic that, that uh, you're going to be seeing a lot more from AIM um, with this graphic coming in 2019, um, in how the way that, that, you know, that we're going to be discussing how things are progressing in the industry and how the, the different ways that the, all of this can dovetail in with the, the content service, process services, analytic services, and on how they interconnect and interweave with each other, you know, still wrapping with this holistic area. And, um, and, and, just, and someone has asked specifically just to go through, because I, I realize that the, the print on here is a bit small, uh, to just on, on the, the different uh, topic areas that uh, we are classifying in each of those sections. And just wanted to ask you to go back in and, and uh, touch on those a little bit more specifically. So the various areas. Um, okay. Um, this slide shows them in the final graphic. It may be a little bit clearer in the earlier slides. Um, and I also saw a question in the Q&A that was kind of trying to understand where in an organization the information role is, which I find a very interesting question. And uh, so I think that um, without giving examples of software, and I find that when I look at these, I start immediately thinking of software first, um, business content collaboration, you know, the platform that we may use for, for collaboration here, uh, transactional content, which may be where you're interacting with an internal and external customer through case management or some sort of pro business process, um, how you're moving content between systems, how you're doing things like uh, legal discovery or anything where you have cons sort of a compliance stuff to include records management, preservation, and all those sorts of um, maybe statutory if you're working for a uh, federal or state entity under the content services. So um, that's a very familiar place for AIM to be. And, you know, you will, you will find um, those uh, services uh, among people who typically deal with those things, you know, a lot of back office folks and then the, the knowledge workers who are out in the organizations working. With regard to process services, um, now you're going to have to start expanding 
um, and getting your IT people more involved, you're getting your process people more involved, you're starting to talk about user interfaces and some really technical aspects to the security that you're doing. So uh, you may be getting your privacy folks involved when you start talking about things like blockchain and that. So in the process services, you're really focusing about, you know, just that very first slide I put out of my personal ex experience that I found that this is very important because you can't talk, you can't deal with, as an end user, you can't talk about content services without getting involved in the process process part of your business. So um, robotic process automation is something that uh, in our organization we haven't done a lot of per se, but it's really all about uh, helping um, your process workers um, spend less time doing those uh, sort of data entry type tasks and get into tasks that require more human thought. And by automating parts or entire pieces of your process um, through uh, tools, then you can uh, increase your efficiency, um, considerably save money, not necessarily get rid of workers, but have them doing more value-added parts uh, of the business. Uh, in analytics, going from uh, simple, uh, you know, where is the, re how many reports are late, how many, you know, into much more um, complex uh, ways of using your data to get out in front of your customers. Um, doing things uh, with semantics and um, big data and things that uh, will quickly uh, blow me away. And that's why I continue to grow my network with folks who are in the data world who are doing this. You know, one of the things is that in the federal go government, for example, there is not a job series for data scientists. You know, there's not, there's not, you have to find something that's close to it. So this is an area that personally I know that we need to grow in our organization, but ultimately there's a lot of value that remains on the table if you're not um, exploring analytics services and the things that are out there, and, and you can use that um, to do many different things in your organization. So there's, there's a little bit more meat on those bones. Um, and uh, I mean, I can go on to, if you want, Teresa, to answer the, the question about the departments that information no, come I, under. I, 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 um, oh, I, I want a shot at that one. I want a Go. shot at that one. I'm okay, stepping okay, back. Wait, please. <laughs> Here, take the microphone. No, so the question is, hey, where does information management live, right? In what departments, just to be uh, clear. So I did in a, a series of events with AIM last year. We took a, a little roadshow around the country, and we, we were talking about emerging technologies. But I would start by asking the audience to raise their hand, and I would say, hey, who's in information management here in this room? And maybe half the people would raise their hand, and I would glower at the other half, and I would say, we're all in information management, especially those records manager governance people on the, on the call today will recognize that uh, they've been trying to tell people that, you know, security and governance starts with every individual person because of emails and all the different inter interactions we have. So we really ought to start thinking about all of ourselves within information management. Now, a lot of these automation uh, projects may be owned and run by line of business owners. If uh, you're in insurance, maybe a claims process, underwriting process in banking, it might be a uh, underwriting or new customer onboarding or mortgage processing. I mean, these processes can be automated and, and the, those owners, but there's so many users and then there's so many benefits that go back to the customer that it really, you have to take the word that Mark brought up earlier, a holistic approach here, and start thinking about how information touches, and especially content, which customers are getting it and re returning it uh, in the form of you know, forms and documents and correspondence. And so it, it's really flying around the entire organization. So that's why I get back to that, that holistic approach. We're all in, in information management, and we all need to think that uh, this stuff is stuff we can use and, and make our, uh, our lives uh, a little better and make our customers' lives a little happier. Thanks. Here, here. Well, um, just wanted to mention a couple other things here. Um, just come back to my notes so I say this correctly here that um, it, 
as Mark and I both have mentioned and we've been to, uh, mentioned several times about the AIM conference, and it is coming up in San Diego in March of 2019, and it really is just around the corner. And right now we are doing a drawing. So for anyone who newly registers for the conference, uh, between now and January 14th, we'll be entered to win uh, two free hotel nights um, on us, and that's valued at $570. And we'll be choosing three lucky people uh, after January 14th. Um, so for more information, go to uh, aimconference.com slash giveaway. And that's the link that is in the resources section. Or when you download the PDF of the slide, um, the slide is also linked to that, uh, that uh, um, aimconference.com slash giveaway address. So you can um, you know, register for the event in, in, uh, over the next few weeks. Um, actually for about, uh, about the next month, and be eligible to win some free hotel nights. Uh, that uh, certainly all helps our travel budgets when it comes to uh, training classes like this, because we really want to see you there. And uh, just want to mention that um, you know, at AIM, we do offer the, the live instructor-led training, um, as well as the online self-paced courses, and, and, and it's all from a variety of different topics. And we can even arrange for a trainer to come to your place of business and to provide that custom perspective of our instructor-led programs. Um, there's also the Certified Information professional, professional designation, and we offer review classes to prepare for that exam. So if you go to AIM.org slash training, you can learn about all of the different uh, training programs that we do offer, and uh, uh, an AIM uh, person at training, um, uh, uh, at, at that AIM.org slash training, someone there can just help you decide which course would be best for you. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of our webinar that we did conduct a drawing um, and for registering for this event and for uh, by attending that we were going to draw a name and my colleague Kate has drawn that name and informed me that the winner of that uh, is uh, Dawn Lazaro and, and she's with the City of Clearwater. So Dawn, thank you so much. You are the winner of, our, of uh, one of our BPM specialist online course and um, uh, Kate and Maureen, they're going to uh, get back with you to get you the details so that you can access that. So thank you so much uh, for you know, not only registering and learning more about what we're talking about today, and you're even, even going to get a taste of that training that we uh, are offering for you. So um, as we are coming to the end of our webinar time here, just want to uh, remind everyone that we have recorded things and it will be available in the next day or two at the resources uh, webinars page on AIM.org. Um, don't forget to download the resources. Please take the survey. I very much want to thank our underwriter, IBM. Without the support from our solution providers, we wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs. So thank you so much, IBM, for your sponsorship. And as we do bring this webinar to a close, just want to leave everyone with our speaker's closing thoughts from today. And so I want to start first with David Janess of IBM, your closing thoughts. Well, thank you, Teresa. I'm uh, thinking about resolutions, and resolutions, of course, are, are practical. What are we going to stop doing next year, or what are we going to start doing next year better? And uh, I talk a lot with customers, and that's the best part of my job. And uh, a lot of them say, I, I really would like help building a business case and, and a message that I can take to internal stakeholders. And so I think my, my resolution will be to work harder at that, to help uh, customers develop those stories and, and help persuade the uh, organization that intelligent information management improves the business and the ability to engage with customers. And I know this is the mission of AIM as well, so I feel like we're, we're well aligned on that. Uh, but it's something that we all need to work at because uh, we are our own uh, public relations uh, uh, agents, and uh, we need to uh, communicate the benefits of this stuff uh, so that uh, everybody sees it uh, for the value that it really does bring. Thank you, David. And Mark Patrick from Ames Board of Directors, your closing thoughts today. Absolutely. So I would suggest that uh, folks who are here, if you're just sticking your toe in the water, especially with AIM content, that you resolve to get more involved with AIM. I can't um, overstate how um, important it was to me as I transitioned from the military and came into this full time. I mean, you end up uh, 
not flying forever in the military, so I started in information management while still on active duty and then transitioned into a supervisory role, and I really was looking for a network of other end users and folks that I could talk to in a friendly environment where I wasn't always being pitched to, and I found the local chapter of AIM, and it was all that, and it has continued to be that through the years. So I would I would uh, encourage folks, if you're looking for that kind of community, whether it's in person, which you could, if you have a local chapter available or at the uh, conference, I'll definitely be there. So if you want to get into more detail about um, some of the things that I touched on only briefly, I'd be happy to talk to you uh, on the sidelines of the conference um, coming up. And I would say that um, you might also want to consider some of the thoughts if there's an area that's in that a set of skills and capabilities in intelligent information management that you, um, you have a gap on to, to spend some time learning about that uh, through formal or informal training so that you can prepare yourself to be you know, more effective in that holistic environment. I would encourage you to reach out in your organization, um, maybe external to your organization, and make a few new relationships this year in areas that are you know, sort of related to what you do, but not exactly you know, uh, your main portfolio. But uh, that's what we have to do to be that kind of cross-cultural communicator and connector. Uh, start building that holistic approach. Stay positive. There's no fear required here, even though, uh, you know, for me, that's a motivator. But um, uh, I really want to thank everyone for attending, and, uh, and I hope to see you at the conference in San Diego. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, Frame, this is Teresa Resick, and we will see you with our next event. Have a good afternoon.